Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to Introducing Homo Naledi, our newest relative, presented by John Mead. This event is hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, your community for science and secularism. My name is Rohit Mohindra, and I am the Toronto branch manager and a board member for CFIC. Uh, we are Canada's only national nonprofit with the mission of promoting and educating the public on critical thinking, science, and secularism. We help people make decisions based on evidence, rational thinking, and compassion. Therefore, in line with our mission statement is to hold events like these where we provide a venue for subject matter experts, intellects, and free thinkers to engage with you. In order to put on events like these, we heavily rely on donations and memberships. Please consider this as you enjoy the talk, which I'm very excited about. So here's a bit of background about our speaker, and I'm gonna try to go a bit slowly. Um, it's very impressive. Um, so John is a biology teacher who serves as the Eugene McDermott Master Teacher in Science at the St. Mark School of Texas, where he has taught since 1990. As a lifelong enthusiast of human origins, he has grown into an outspoken voice for expanding and improving evolution education. He, he regularly works with and talks to various groups about the exploration, science, and adventure that has been the ongoing Homo Naledi discovery. As a part of his evolution education outreach, John contributes to the National Geographic Education blog via his Talking Evolution column. He is a board member for many anthropology and evolution groups. He serves as an evolution teacher ambassador for the National Center for Science Education and was awarded the 2018 National Association of Biology Teachers Outstanding Biology Teacher Award for Texas and the 2019 Evolution Education Award. During the summer of 2019, he served as the lead microscopist for the National Geographic's Micro Amazon Expedition to the Boiling River in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, you can follow his adventures on Twitter at Evo Explorer and his YouTube channel, JS Mead, as well as his nature photography website, bluelionphotos.com. And I will post the links to all of these in the chat so you can have access to them. Uh, the agenda for, tonight, or for today's event will be as follows. We're going to start the presentation in which John will be able to speak to you for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so. And then we're going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, at that time, if you have a question, you can raise your hand uh, using the Zoom controls and I will unmute you. Um, you'll be able to ask your question and we'll allow for a follow-up question um, on the same uh, related topic. So with all that preamble completed, I now bring you John Mead. Well, thank you very, very much. I uh, appreciate that, that warm introduction, and it's great to uh, have a chance to uh, get to meet a lot of my Canadian colleagues up there. And um, I hope that this is a story that few, if any of you, have heard. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating story, and I'm going to take you from the beginnings of my involvement with it up to really um, the beginning of the pandemic. This is, as a science teacher, one of the things I am big on, and you may have heard it when we were talking earlier, is that we teach the, the value of exploration and discovery and how that moves us forward as scientists and even as, even science geeks. Um, let's be honest, not everyone is a scientist, but it is critically important in the world today that we have people who are science literate. And that is something that I am hugely uh, proud to be an unabashed uh, evangelist for, that we need far more science literacy and science understanding than we have out there in the world today. And this is something that I've been involved with that helps, I think, to allow people to have a better understanding of how we go about that. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and get us started here. Um, can everyone see, see that okay? Is that coming through okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. So again, many thanks to um, the Center for Inquiry for the invitation here. And you can see my school here in Dallas at the St. Mark's School of Texas. 
We are um, a one through 12 boys school. So at some point, if you hear me refer to my boys and you wonder what about the girls, I'm not being deliberately misogynistic that way. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in because there's lots to share here. So the storyline here actually begins um, back in 2012. And I teach about all sorts of human origin stuff, all sorts of species. And the way I go about that is telling the story of their discoveries because for my middle school boys, that just gets them right away. They're into adventure, exploration. Um, I also get geography into it because discoveries from Europe, um, Indonesia, China, um, and throughout Africa. It's a great um, stepping stone to, to do the geographical side of that. So it is August of 2012. We're gonna go back in time eight years. And um, I had become aware of a new species that had been discovered, which you see in front of you, Australopithecus sediba. It was discovered um, outside of a cave in Johannesburg, South Africa, in a place called the Cradle of Humankind. Hey, sorry, where... sorry, John. Uh, I think we've got the robot uh, microphone thing going. Uh, okay, hold on a sec. Silly robot mic. There we go. Are we better now? Good. All right, sorry about that, everybody. No problem. Um, so now let me get back to where I was. Even when you know exactly what you're doing, it can be a challenge here. There we go. All right, everyone back to the Sediba screen? All right. So, um, so this uh, species had actually been discovered um, the interesting part is Sediba was discovered on this day, today in 2008, and I become aware of it just prior to 2012. And um, I was like, ooh, a new species to talk about. So how do I find out? I don't know anything about the discovery story of it, but as it turned out, I was friends on Facebook with the guy who had discovered it. And it was kind of, we, neither of us remembers how we became friends, but you see him over here on the left, Dr. Lee Berger, who's a paleoanthropologist at the University of the Witzvatersrand in Johannesburg. And so I reached out to him on Facebook one night in August. I saw that his, um, his little green light was on. And so I sent him a message. And what follows is our first conversation. And this for students out there is a great lesson that your digital footprint follows you everywhere. Because I don't remember this from memory. I went back and I actually copied the conversation years later. So your messaging sticks around. So it was August 20th, 2012 at, or 2012, yeah, 2012 at 8.54 PM. And I said, Jerry's from Texas, Dr. Berger, honored to be a Facebook friend with you here. Can I steal a few minutes of your valuable day? And what I expected was radio silence because he was a world famous paleoanthropologist who knew millions of people and i was a teacher in texas who knew nobody and so i was particularly surprised when he responded to me with a four-letter word that happened to start with the letter s thankfully it was sure and um from that we had a conversation that i explained and asked him would he be willing to share a couple emails back and forth with my students about the discovery of Sediba. And my plan was that would be it. And he then surprised me and said, well, John, as it turns out, um, in November, I'm going to be in Dallas as part of, a, or taking a break from my book tour about a book that's coming out in October called The Skull and the Rock. And it's written for middle school students and it's about the discovery of Sediba. Well, I realized that this upcoming book was gonna be a jackpot. And so I asked him before I really got my sense about me, I found myself saying, hey, on your break when you're in Dallas, could you uh, maybe come and visit us for an hour? And expecting him then to get, take on a foghorn leghorn voice and say, boy, boy, I said, boy, you bother me, go away. But instead, he said, 
yeah, I'd be willing to do that. And if we could get a larger audience than just your students, perhaps we could um, have National Geographic, the publisher, uh, make Dallas a stop on the book tour. So one thing led to another, and um, we were able to connect with our local natural history museum, the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. And in November of 2012, Lee Berger came, spoke to um, several groups of our students, and then um, that night spoke to um, the Perot Museum's uh, donors and the like, and we had a wonderful time. And afterward at dinner, he said, John, you know, I really wasn't expecting this in Dallas. Um, I expected, you know, part of it, we didn't have it on the book tour because it was not perceived as a place that would be welcoming of the story of human origins. And you've really surprised me with how your school and the, the museum community uh, welcomed us. So one thing we need to do, John, is we need to get you down this coming summer to see the Sediba bones in South Africa. And immediately my jaw dropped. And once I could pick it up off the ground, I uh, did what all of you would do in that, and I turned him down. Now, lest you think I'm totally crazy, um, I turned him down because I had two weeks before signed a contract to help run a nature photography camp uh, that summer. And so he then told me, you know, well, well, we'll find another time, I understand, which I knew was his polite way of saying, it's okay, but we'll never really work this out. That's the way the world works, right? Well, long story short, that summer camp um, wound up about a month later being canceled. And so I reached out to him and said, does your offer still stand? He said, yes. Um, I applied for a grant through my school and some other folks and was able to get funding then to go spend two weeks in South Africa in June of 2013 where on the left here, I got to um, visit with, with Dr. Berger at the actual site of the discovery called Malapa. I got to spend days in the lab with uh, Sadiba. You can see it in, in the middle there in its travel case. Um, the skull in the rock that the book refers to is right up here. And then, and there were two skeletons. This is just one, one of the two that was uh, discovered there. And then on my very last day, um, Dr. Berger took me over to the, um, the fossil vault where all of, almost all of South Africa's fossils at the time were kept. And it was a, it's a small room, a little bit bigger than a, it was a large walk-in closet, I would call it. And he got a black box up off a tall shelf, opened it up and handed me what you see over on the right-hand side. And I looked at him and it was, it's called the Tong Child. It was the very first human-related fossil to be discovered in Africa. It was discovered in 1924 by miners and handed over to the University of the Witwatersrand around Professor Raymond Dart. And I looked at this and I said, oh, cool, this cast of the, uh, the Tong Child, which was one of, one of the most famous human fossils in the world. I would say maybe second only to Lucy. And he said, John, that's not a cast. That's the real thing. And I was like, no, take it back. I can't hold this. I'm not allowed to. And he said, I'm, the, I'm the, basically the curator of this. Yes, you can hold it. Um, and you see, it looks like it was Christmas, my birthday, and the lottery all fell on the same day there. So this trip to, to South Africa in June of 2013 was absolutely amazing. And I returned to Dallas, and I was on cloud nine. What more did I need in my scientific life? I've gotten to do things almost no one else would do. And I went and I talked about it a lot and I was very excited. I didn't know that that excitement was not going to last very long because it was gonna get kicked up another huge notch. And here it comes, October of 2013. I got an email from Lee Berger and it was CC'd with about 50 other people in it. Just said, today is a great day in the history of paleoanthropology, dot, dot, dot. And I was like, well, Lee, what's going on? This is kind of a, you know, a cryptic sort of thing. What I didn't know at that part and what really no one outside of his small circle there in South Africa knew is the, the two guys you see on your screen 
to the left, Stephen Tucker to the right, uh, Rick Hunter. They were amateur cavers. And they had gone down into a cave in South Africa called the Rising Star Cave. And if you are someone who's a caver and you want to teach someone how to cave in South Africa, this is the cave you take them to. This is the cave where there's really easy stuff, there's harder stuff, but it's the most famous um, cave in the area. And they had gone in and they were, they're expert cavers and they had pushed the, the boundaries of the map and they got to the end of the map and they were ready to turn around and come back and they were resting up on a ledge and they, they looked over to the side and there was a crack. It was about um, eight inches wide and it went down into the darkness and they're like, these are the sorts of guys who are like, let's see what happens if we go down. So they went down and it turns out to be a, about a 35 to 40 foot um, crevice that goes down. We now refer to it as the chute. They got down and when they got down to the bottom, they, they dropped into this chamber that you see here. And if any of you have an interest in paleontology and the like, and you, you scan the floor of this uh, chamber, you'll notice what seem to be bones on the surface, these white things there. And so they went down and they looked and up closely. And for scale, you can see this is Rick's foot, his boot here, just so you get a sense. Um, and you might notice some what look like long bones here, more long bones. This looks like it could be a femur perhaps. Um, and they weren't biologists by any stretch of the imagination. But if you're a caver, you know a little bit about uh, bones. And they knew that Lee Berger had asked the caving community if they saw any interesting bones in caves to alert him. Now, also, if you look over here on the left, you'll notice what may look like a jawbone. And indeed, it is. So they took these pictures. They got back out, and they, they went to Lee Berger's house. And if you know anything about Johannesburg, South Africa, one of the, the great tragedies of that city is its crime rate. And so everybody lives behind walls and barbed wire and the like. Um, and the saying goes, if you live in Johannesburg and your mother calls, calls on you after dark to let her in, you don't. Um, you know, that's, and that's a sad testament to things. So they went and they went to Lee's house and they rang the buzzer and he answered and they said, Dr. Berger, you're going to want to see what we have. And he was like, who are these idiots? No, of course I'm not going to let you in. But eventually they convinced him. And they showed him the pictures you just saw, as well as this. And he realized immediately that these were human-like fossils and they needed to be um, gotten out. They ne he needed to mount an expedition. Because if I go back for a moment, one of the things he noticed on these bones you can see it looks like there's a little crushing here. And then the whiteness of the edges of some of these bones indicated that they had been disturbed sometime in the recent past, within maybe the last few years. And he was concerned that if Rick and Steve had found them, maybe other people had. And Rick and Steve swore that they had not damaged the bones at all. Um, so that was a, a concern. So he calls um, National Geographic and basically says, I need the funding to start a new expedition here. Um, we're gonna put Sediba on hold. Um, we need to, need to get these out and quickly. And it looked like it was probably part of one skeleton there. And so um, he realized this chute that I mentioned, um, very few people could fit through it. Um, we're talking eight inches wide in some areas. And uh, Lee Berger is a middle-aged um, guy who is not by any means small. Um, the term we like to use is physiologically inappropriate for the cave. Uh, like me, he would tell you we're too fat to get in. Um, and that makes up about 99% of the world being um, inappropriate to get into the cave. So he realized he needed experts in anthropology and archeology span and to excavate these, and they had to be able to get down in there. So he did what a normal scientist would do, he put out an ad on Facebook. And I won't read you the whole thing, but it basically says, I need the help of the whole community. Um, reach out to your groups. We're hoping to get an expedition together in the next month or so. 
And the catch is this, and I will read this part. The person must be skinny and preferably small, must not be claustrophobic. They must be fit, should have some caving experience. Climbing experience would be a bonus. They must be willing to work in cramped quarters, have a good attitude, and be a team player. And he expects that maybe there are four people in the world who would have this combination of things. He winds up getting about 60 uh, responses. He quickly narrows those down to about a dozen. He does a Skype call um, because in 2012 um, or 2013, none of us had Zoom yet, so we were still Skyping. And um, he interviews and, and narrows that dozen or so down to six. And those six wind up being the women you see here. Um, it's six women from around the world. We have, um, and I'll go kind of left to right. Uh, you have Hannah Morris, who is a uh, graduate student at the University of Georgia. Uh, Marina Elliott, um, a Canadian from, uh, from British Columbia. Um, Becca Pichotto, who is at the American University in Washington, DC. Um, Ellen Farragal, who was um, at uh, Australian University. Um, Aliyah Gertoff, uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Lindsay Hunter, who is at the University of Texas. Go Texas. And so um, they were all brought down to South Africa and they would form the team that would get the nickname, the Underground Astronauts. And here was what they had to deal with. This is a kind of a cross section of the rising star cave that we're interested in. You have the, the main entrance is right over here on the left. And basically, you can walk down here. Most of this is an easy part. There are a few narrow passages. You get down to Superman's Crawl, which you can see it tells you is less than 10 inches high. And you have to get through it um, crawling like Superman flies with one arm kind of up over your head. And so that gives the, uh, that got the name there. Through there, you go into what's called the Dragon's Back Chamber and you climb up Dragon's Back, which is about 40 feet high. Um, and the rock outcroppings there um, look like the spine of a dragon, that's the, the name. And then you get up here, and this is where Rick and Steve were when they said, oh, let's see what this crack does. And here's the chute, which drops you into what we call the Dinaletti chamber, and that's of a local language, it means chamber of stars. And um, the fossil site that you've seen is right here, this little red dot. The team got so good at going in and out of this that they could do this in about a half an hour um, one way. So just to give you a sense for, uh, for what that involves. And the chamber was small enough that really they never had more than uh, two people in it at a time. So as October turned into November, the team um, rigged up a whole system where they put um, cabling from the surface tents down into the chamber so that there could be a uh, audio and video communication. And you have um, pictures here. You can see this is the team up at the surface, uh, Lee Berger here, and they're looking at folks um, down in the chamber at that point. Here you can see uh, Marina, um, Aaliyah, and um, Lindsay here as team members. Uh, Dr. Berger's son, Matthew here, who actually discovered Sediba. And then um, here you can see this is climbing up Dragon's Back. And they had cameras the whole way along so that they could watch for safety issues. And then deeper into the cave, here you are on the left having a chance to look down from the top down into the chute. Um, and the woman you see in the um, orange uh, overalls here, that's Dr. Berger's daughter, who's now a graduate student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, so he had both of his children um, busy um, as part of the safety team. And then here we have uh, two of the scientists down actually in the uh, chamber itself. And this is before they did any excavating. They used a 3D white light scanner to scan the entire surface of the uh, cave so that they could then later on rebuild it in a 3D um, environment as they needed to. So they had full um, understanding of what each layer they were going to alter um, was like before they even touched it. And then finally, bones started coming up. And this is the, uh, the first bag of bones. You can see Dr. Berger holding it here with Becca who had just brought it up. Um, 
they, they cleaned off the surface bones that you saw, and then they began to dig a little bit deeper, and it became very clear by the second day of expedition that um, this was not just one skeleton, because they had discovered by that part, point in time, two right femurs. And if you're at all a biologist, I don't need to tell you that there is no animal, vertebrate animal out there that has two right femurs. And so um, some of you may say, well, what about all the quadrupeds? They would have a femur and then on the front forelimbs, that would be a humerus. So they realized this was more than one skeleton. It quickly became clear that there were more than two, more than three based on duplicate bones. And so it became very clear very early on that this was a bigger deal than anyone expected. And Berger coined the term underground astronauts because he felt like it was a space expedition where you had mission control up in that tent talking as if they were in space to the uh, folks actually in the chamber. So the name underground astronauts kind of stuck there and this was their uh, photograph they all decided to pose as if they were actual astronauts and kind of their right stuff pose. So um, this became, becomes an amazing thing and I want you to have a sense of what it was like down there. So this is a video clip of going through, this is the Superman crawl I mentioned, and this is gonna be uh, Rick Hunter going through it and just to give you a sense for how tight this is. And one question a lot of you are gonna come up with as you see this is, well, why don't they make the space bigger? You know, why, why not make it bigger so that other people can get in? You'll see that the structure here is not the most stable to begin with. So by expanding um, these passageways, you run the risk of collapse of the whole cave. And in addition, it's in a protected area. It's a UNESCO um, World Heritage Site there in the cradle of humankind. So you really can't, change it that way. And as Berger has said, why should I try to make this bigger so that my big ego could get in when I have amazing people who can do the job better than I could anyway? So here's just a, a, a taste of um, Rick going through uh, the Superman crawl here. And you're gonna see they've set the, um, this is a, filmed with a GoPro just to give you the, uh, the sense for it here. And Rick is a, um, his, his nickname is Stick Man because he is just that skinny. And mind you, this is not as uh, tight a squeeze as some of the squeezes in the shoot are. So you also probably have an appreciation of how you really can, could not be claustrophobic and be a member of, um, of this team. And then you can see as he gets out, things widen open a little bit more. And then you really learn to squiggle your body. And then we're gonna in a moment switch over and give you a look of what some parts of going down the uh, chute are. And I mentioned how tight the chute is. Um, there are parts that are a little bit wide, are wider than eight inches but you'll get a, um, get a good feel when we, as soon as we get Rick done with here. There we go, okay, here we are in the uh, chute. Um, and you can see I'm going down there um, and you'll see a light flashing from below here in a moment. Okay, those are folks further down. So this, you see how, tight that is. And as we go down the, the rock that this light is on here, you'll see it's loose. Later on in the expedition, that rock uh, fell over and landed on the uh, hand of a National Geographic photographer and fractured several fingers. And by the way, Rick uh, here, he can dislocate his shoulders at will. So not for the, uh, the, the squeamish there to, uh, to say the least. So. That was an amazing thing. And so by the end of this, by the end of November, they had collected more fossils than any other, um, let me say it, any other human um, fossil site on the continent of Africa. So it was the largest uh, collection 
ever at that point. Now, one of the things that was amazing during this is that I had the opportunity to be a part of it as things happened day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And indeed, with my students back in Dallas, I was a, we were able to communicate with the team because they, were, they did something that had never happened before. They live tweeted everything that happened, literally minute by minute. So as a result, my students could tweet back to them and ask questions and they would respond to us. And I realized it was about the second day, all of this tweeting was great, but it would go the way of most tweets. And remember, this is 2013, so we're not, um, Twitter isn't then what it is now. And I realized there were lots of people who weren't on Twitter and all of these um, tweets would kind of go off into the internet ether and be lost. So I started with the team's permission to gather every day in the evening all of the relevant tweets, and I basically made a, a video play-by-play, -play, as it was called, of that day's event. So here you can see update five, and it's me narrating my Twitter feed, basically. It's visually quite boring, but um, the families that were involved who didn't have Twitter could follow, and then students in classrooms um, around the world started to follow, which was really neat. And the power of this was that this worldwide audience was starting to get the, the feel of what a true scientific expedition was like. My favorite moment of the whole thing was when Lindsay Hunter over here on the right, she on her personal Facebook page one night posted a long thing. And if you're a Harry Potter fan, you'll appreciate this. It was called Akio Skull. When Akio is the spell, it means bring something to me. And so it was the day when they brought up the first skull fragment. And so she explained the whole thing in wonderful detail. And I messaged her and I said, hey, Lindsay, could I um, read this, read your post into the nightly play-by-play? Uh, -play? And she said, sure, even better, why don't I record it for you and I'll email it to you? And I was like, great. So here it went, this was like midnight my time in Dallas. But by 8 a.m. the next morning, I was playing her voice for my students about something that she had taken out of the ground the day before. Um, and that was just amazing. And this is unheard of in paleoanthropology. Um, most paleoanthropologists would tell you their field is like a bunch of uh, kindergarten children um, with fancy toys not sharing them with each other. So what did they actually find? Well, Lee Berger comes and visits my students um, in January of 2014, and he brings some amazing um, imagery with him to share. They found five um, complete or nearly complete uh, sets of foot bones. And in the history of paleoanthropology, the study of human origins, there had never been a complete foot ever recovered from any other fossil site. And here they had multiple uh, complete bones and you can see how complete it is. You're really just missing one bone um, right here. Okay, and the quality of the preservation was amazing. In addition to feet, they, they had, I believe it was eight nearly complete hands. Uh, this one, it was even in its kind of death grip um, when it was discovered. Again, every bone that is, is there, unheard of because normally um, hand and foot bones, because they're so small, wind up being washed away by rain um, or taken away by wind. And so having them complete is, had been unheard of. And here you have multiple sets of them from this species. Here you can see a, a maxilla and a mandible from one of the specimens um, in very pristine condition there. And here's the composite of uh, the first skull that Lindsay helped bring up. There, the Akio skull. Um, and you can see it's missing at that point most of the mid facial bones, but the rest of it is uh, very much complete. And so, well, I'll, I'll stop there for a moment. Um, so this was amazing. And so I followed up and then through much of uh, 2014, the uh, Berger and the team worked on figuring out what it was they had. Uh, they brought in as many um, experts from ver various fields of paleoanthropology who had worked on other species to get an idea. And they realized they had indeed a new species, Homo naledi. 
Um, you know, they had over 2,000 fossil fragments to deal with. Again, the largest uh, collection ever from one site. And so that was amazing. And, and as I worked more with the team and talking with them, I got an invitation to come back in the summer of 2015. Um, and I had a specific job to do for them this time. Um, as an educator, they wanted me to come and be able to help share their story in an educationally appropriate way. Um, so I spent uh, another two weeks there. I actually got to go into the cave. So this is the entrance to the Rising Star Cave here on the left. Here is the main entry chamber. This is a skylight that goes up um, and the way down to the fossil chamber is off to the left here. And you can see my camera set up for scale here. That's a tripod with my SLR on it. And they asked me, would I do interviews with all the major members of the team? From the exploration team you can see on the right here um, to all the major scientists. And so I was happy to do that. I wound up doing a dozen um, interviews that range in from about 10 minutes to 30 minutes. So these were not going to be your quick news um, interviews where, hey, in 30 seconds, how did you feel when you found the fossil? But these were gonna be a little bit more in depth where we could get into the science of it and they could be used in classrooms and the like. And so that um, wound up being my series of Rising Star interviews, which I have, and those are all posted on my YouTube channel so that anyone can go see those. Um, and that was a really special um, opportunity for me to have that connection to do that. And so then um, at the end of uh, my visit there in July of 2015, I was leaving. I interviewed uh, Dr. Berger on the last morning. And, you know, he reminded me that this was all uh, hush, hush, top secret until things were announced, what they were hoping would be in September of 2015. And so I had to keep my mouth shut, which... You might already guess from just knowing me for this short period of time, that was a difficult thing to do, especially knowing that you had the biggest fossil discovery since Lucy and you couldn't tell anybody. That was tough. But then September of 2015, the big announcement, um, I got to release my um, interviews and it was on the front page news all over the world. It was here you see on the front page of the New York Times and we had to laugh because if you look, that is not a Homo naledi skull on the New York Times. They goofed up and that is actually a skull of Australopithecus Africanus. Uh, we all immediately deluged the Times with, you need to correct this, you need to correct this. And in their digital version, they did pretty quickly. But um, here you get to see the layout of most of the uh, major bones from the Dinaledi chamber here, as well as, and there's the skull. And so I began then having the opportunity to talk far and wide about this um, discovery. And the first thing we need to do is, well, what exactly did they get out of the ground? What, what exactly is Homo naledi? And so here you can see the reconstruction on the left done by uh, John Gurch. Um, and it's a very interesting thing. Everyone made notice that naledi looks really, really grumpy. And that was because when they announced it in September of 2015, Naledi didn't have a date, meaning they hadn't dated the fossils, but we all had fun with he's grumpy because he doesn't have a date to go to prom with. Um, but Naledi turned out to be the strangest creature you could imagine as a human and uh, relative because it had some features that were very, very modern and some that were very primitive. And I like the way Geographic did this. On the left side, you see the more um, advanced features. The skull was really small, not human-like that way, but the shape of it uh, was a lot like a Homo erectus skull, just about a third of the size of a modern human skull. And then as um, so you go down the hands, you, which you've seen up in, in person a little bit, they are um, very modern. The fingers are a little bit more curved than yours and mine, but otherwise very modern. Um, the leg bones are very similar to ours, okay? Um, the feet, if you took those feet to a podiatrist and you said, hey, you know, here are modern human feet, they wouldn't doubt you, um, at least morphologically. They are um, very modern. And then, and notice, all of these things tend to be things that tended to come in contact with the environment. 
whereas the things more toward the core of the uh, skeleton, uh, the shoulder, for instance, is much more like the shoulder almost of a gibbon, a very ape-like shoulder. Uh, the pelvis, even though these were good upright walkers, it was a little bit more chimp-like, a little bit more like Lucy. Um, and so, and then the, the spinal column, actually, the structure of the spine is more of a Neanderthal style. So had you discovered individual scraps of the skeleton by themselves, you might have thought it was different species, but here they were clearly all together um, and clearly all of the same species, which got the name Homo naledi because it was in the rising star cave. Uh, naledi in the local uh, Sutu language means star, so star human. Now the biggest question that really came out of this was, you know, no, and people accepted we have a new species here. Um, there was no problem with that, but the real challenge that came is what the heck are these bones doing in such a remote chamber of an inaccessible cave and why are, why are they there? So let's take a look at the facts of what they actually had and then we can look at, well, how might, might they have gotten there? So by the end, they had bones from 15 different individuals. Again, the largest collection of human uh, relatives ever found in Africa. The age range. They had infants all the way up to the elderly, and probably up to, that means maybe people in their 50s, which you know, was elderly in the, in the Stone Age there. Um, both males and females represented. And while these things were all dead, there was no obvious cause of death. Um, no obvious uh, signs that were left on the bones themselves. The hands and feet, as you saw, were articulated. They were intact which tells us that those skeletons were intact when they went into the cave and they must have then either died in the cave or gone down there very shortly after death. The bones had no predator damage either from active predators that might have killed them or predators that might have scavenged uh, carcasses. No evidence of any bone damage from predators. The bones had not been moved by water. This had never been like a stream going through here or anything like that. Again, proof of that also being that we had hands and feet intact. The geologists in studying the cave, all the sediments that are on the floor of the cave had come from the sides of the roof. There was no external um, movement of sediments or anything else from outside the cave. There were no um, Paleo trash, no debris, no stone tools. There was no evidence that this was in any way, shape, or form a living um, environment for them. This wasn't um, you know, a residence. So all of this just really, as the team looked to you know, answer what, what's going on here, they, they ran out of reasonable things. The geologist also said, there's no other entrance into this cave. Um, there may have been a time when dragon's back may not have been quite as high as it is now. Um, but really everything from about where my mouse is here uh, to the left of Superman crawl uh, past that is in the dark zone of the cave. Um, so the question is where would we find you know, something like this if we found it with modern humans? How would we explain that? And there's one sort of place you find all of these things to be true with the possible exception of an obvious cause of death. Um, and that is in modern day cemeteries. Now the question then becomes, could this actually be a cemetery? And it came to the idea that um, what the team is called ritualized body disposal, that these homo naledi individuals were probably brought into this chamber, dropped down the chute, by living individuals um, as a means of body disposal. And it was ritualized. It was done repeatedly. Um, from the layering of the bones, the estimate is it happened over hundreds of years. It wasn't just a one-off, hey, let's dump everybody in here. Um, why? There were easier ways, if you want to get rid of a stinky corpse so that it doesn't attract predators and scavengers, there are many easier ways to deal with that. So this must have meant something to the mind of Homo naledi, but what that mean, 
what that is, obviously. There's no evidence in the fossil record that tells us what that is. We just know that this was a repeated event. So that, and that is, then this hypothesis requires some follow-up and that's what winds up happening. And I'll tell you now, once this announcement goes out, it becomes, you know, big news. Um, indeed, Discover Magazine put it down as the number two science story of 2015. Um, Number one, you'll be curious, was the uh, mission to Pluto and its announcement in, in the summer of 2015. So um, one of the things, again, Berger said he was going to make things open access. And so the day they announced Naledi, they also announced that you could 3D print selected fossils from Naledi. So here you could see the mandible, the maxilla, that piece of another ma ma mandible, excuse me, there, and then uh, part of the cranium there. You can see the edge of the eye socket here, the orbital ridge. Um, I had those printed and showing those to my students the day after they were announced. So we were able to get stuff into classrooms very quickly, and those are still available, more on that later. Here you get an example of the value of 3D printing, the original fossil versus my 3D print, and so students are able to to have something that is remarkably accurate and able to um, ask questions that as if they have the actual fossils in their hands. And then we jump ahead now. The work wasn't over. There were hypotheses left to be um, explored. And so um, we're going to see that in May of 2017, there's another announcement that comes out. There's a second chamber. Okay. Um, Harry Potter fans wanted to be called the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, however, um, it's called the Lissetti Chamber, which means in the Sutu language, uh, gift. And they found three more individuals in there, uh, a, an infant, parts of a, a female skeleton, but then a nearly complete skeleton of an elderly male named Neo. You can see it over um, on the right side there. And then they also finally had a date for Naledi. And they, the fossils from that first chamber come in at, in the neighborhood of about 300,000 years old, um, which was very, very young. So this overlapped with early uh, Homo sapiens in Southern Africa. And that has a whole nother round of uh, questions. Um, a lot of people are curious, do we have DNA from Homo naledi? They are still working on trying to get uh, DNA, but we have not been successful um, with that yet. And then September of 2017, they go back in, the original group, and they um, reassemble, and they look to get more fossils, especially fossils at the base of the, um, of the chute, to see if indeed were they dropping bodies down the chute. And if they were, you would expect there to be a pile of bones there. And so here you can see underground astronauts working there. And then they worked also in both uh, chambers. And so let's. And indeed, they did a one Facebook Live session, and they had over 40,000 viewers. So this is a way of really connecting live science with, with people, which is incredibly important. And then the National Geographic Classroom Explorer pro program has put live classes in contact with them on four different continents over time. So they're really, you know, kids are getting to see things that they never could have dreamed of even 10 years ago. And now, moving up to the spring of 2018, um, they had discovered in 2017, yes, there were bones underneath the chute. And so you can see part of um, a conglomeration of bones in that photograph. So they went to work on that some more. They got most of that debris cone moved out of the, the cave so that they could study it in the lab. They got more of the neoskeleton. They then started to do a, um, high-resolution 4K 
video um, mapping of the Dinaletti chamber so that there could be a, a future project. And they continued to do a lot of lot more outreach. And then moving up to the fall of 2018, they expanded the um, underground astronaut team. You can see Lee's tweet on the right here. So four more individuals to work there. Then the Perot Museum in Dallas, this, as a person who lives in North Texas, has made me incredibly happy. Um, they released a virtual Dinaletti app um, and you can get it with Google Play in the App Store where it lets you actually go in and it's a virtual reality on your phone or if you have um, Google Glass or, the, um, or just an Oculus kind of thing, you can actually see the, the filming they did in there and you can actually pick up fossils and play with them. And so you can either go to your, your app store, Google Play, and just do um, virtual Dinaletti and that, that will come up. There's the link, um, link there. And then in the fall of 2019, um, the Perot Museum hosted the first visit of South African fossils to the United States. And they were, were here, um, uh, let me say it. They were here actually until, actually I think they still are here because of COVID, but it was from October through uh, March is when the exhibit closed up. And they had both um, Sadiba and Naledi uh, bones, the original bones on display here in Dallas. And that was needless to say for me, a, a, a lot of fun. I spent many, many hours with students down there. And then here, just to give you a, um, a rundown of the sources and if you want to screenshot this um, this can be helpful um, my blue lion blog which has the play-by-play -play and the videos linked to it um, you can get that at blue lion photos blogspot .com. Uh, PBS and Nova did a um, an hour and a half version of what you've kind of heard me do here called the dawn of humanity that's available for free on YouTube just do dawn of humanity I mentioned you can 3D print the Naledi fossils, and that's at morphosource.com. And then if you want to follow Lee Berger on Twitter, he's a very active tweeter, as you might guess. He's at Lee R. Berger. Um, if you want to read more detail about this, his book, Almost Human, was came out in May of 2017. You can get that through Amazon. Um, the Perot Museum's Human Origins Project, um, Perot Museum at CEHG, that stands for Center of Exploration for the Human Journey. And then um, my own Twitter feed, um, at Evo underscore Explorer. Feel free to follow me there. Um, and I'm kind of wrapped up here. I will, let's leave this up for a little bit and then, um, but I will, I'm ready to take questions for folks.